they work. So I got I got a format. Oh, record. Okay. So they have a format for doing this for for so I have a format for doing mastermind. But if I was going to teach you, Debbie, here's what you do in a mastermind. Um, do a mastermind. Most people they get the idea of how to do something, but they don't know how to deliver it or how to promote it and market it um, or sell it. So to help them take that action of actually creating a mastermind or a course or a training program or a coaching program, what, what, what do you need to give them to enable them to take action? I guess is the word. It's, it's not that they don't want to take action. Everyone wants to take action. They want to go out and make that extra thousand, five thousand, ten thousand dollars a month, but something always holds them back. And a lot of times it's like they just don't know how to implement the steps. Mm -hmm. So it would be like a cookbook. You take one cup of water or you take one cup of flour or and in this case, you would say you take one step here, this step there, the step there. Would it be a process? Well, that's what I'm saying. I'll take away the excuse. If I can host them a webinar that will promote their package that they don't know how to launch, now they have no excuse on the front end of launching their program. I mean, if they're confident their program is going to help people and they want to launch it, now here's the webinar. All you got to do is promote your webinar, taking away all the other um, challenges to get, get yourself out there. You know, you don't have to write a PDF and everyone, everyone could do a short video or do a 20 minute video explaining their, their program. Now, will it work? Can you explain your program well enough to sell it? Um, I don't know, but you know, I'll host what you, what you put together as your sales presentation tool. Um, and all you have to do is go out and, and put it out there. So that's why I'm thinking that might be one of the a good free add-on um, or incentive to take my take my program. We'll go spend four weeks uh, developing your signature offer, and I'm and you know for working with me, I'm going to give you a, a webinar, an evergreen webinar that you can put up, and all you have to all then all you have to do is go put it up on your Facebook with links to sign up pages to watch the webinar to enroll your clientele. I think, I think one of the key things that I'm picking up from here is that being able to articulate what you have to offer in a way that, in a way that is attractive to a customer that that is really the key thing about this. It's it's not so much putting it into a webinar. It's actually being able to articulate the service that you are offering, and then it well, it, active to someone. If if you have if you have gone through and figured out who your ideal customer is, mm -hmm. and what their pain point or problem is, mm -hmm. okay, and you've created the transformational journey for them. And that's what you're going to be offering them is the transformational journey through your, through your offer, through your four week, six week, whatever your, the course development is. So you, you have to know your ideal client. You have to know the pain point and you have to know the transformation. If you know those things, how hard is it to put that into a webinar and why you're the expert and why they should hire you to take the journey with you on your offering? And that is what you would offer. Well, that's what the whole training would be is identifying your ideal client. You know, what's the pain of your ideal client, how you're serving them and how you're helping them transform from point A to point B, get over that gap so that they could have a better life. Okay. That's what goes into the webinar, but and a lot of, and there's a lot of coaches and you know, this, they sit there and they know who they want to help they got an idea how they want to help them because they went from, you know, whatever struggle it was in their life and, and they solved it. So they feel they can help people do the same thing. Well, 
but they don't know how to get the message out there. They're, they're weak on the sales, they're weak on the marketing. They don't know how to, how to get it out there. So, um, I think that's a dilemma. Now we're coming back to that dilemma that coaches have is you're supposed to be good at coaching and then you're supposed to be good at business and then you're supposed to be good at marketing and then you're supposed to be good at sales and then you're supposed to be good on camera. You're supposed to be good um, creating courses. What else are you supposed to be good at? Well, really, as a, as a business owner and entrepreneur, you always start off having to know at least a little bit about all these things, which, which is why being an entrepreneur is a challenge in the first place. Because if you're a good technician, if you're good at, if you're good at coaching, doesn't make you a good entrepreneur, doesn't make you a good business person. Because once you set up a coaching practice or any other practice or business, then you're doing the bookkeeping, you're doing, you know, the legal services, you're doing the promotion, you're doing the sales, you're doing the communications, um, you're emptying the waste paper baskets, filing, you know, you're doing everything, everything. So this is why you need your organizational struct, you need an organization, organizational chart from the beginning, so that you know the things that you're not going to be good at, you could do them temporarily. You can get by by not knowing everything well, but you have to do it. But you start hiring and you figure out what you're going to hire out early on so that your business can grow without you. I mean, if you are just horrible at marketing and sales, that might be the first people you want to hire <laughs> so that your business grows, you know, uh, or or bookkeeping, or, I mean, you should have your, always have your accountant and your attorney um, mm-hmm. on, on hand, you know, you don't, don't work with them every day, because it'd be costly, but you, you have to know your legal structure, uh, and why and how the money flows through your business. But after that, you know, um, maybe you're, maybe you're great at bookkeeping and coaching. So you don't need to hire the bookkeeper, because you can keep it all in QuickBooks pretty easy. And um, so but you need marketing and sales or vice versa, or whatever. You need to know your weaknesses so you can. Oh, yeah. That's one of my favorite things is focus on your strengths. Don't try to fix your weaknesses. Um, get no, you hire strength. out your weaknesses. Yeah. yeah, you find a talent to do it. But I, but I picked up on something, what you just said. It was about um, you should have your org chart already. I mean, you're just starting out in business and you, you're suggesting that it makes sense to have an org chart already. Yeah, from functional day one. Work chart, maybe. Okay. No, from day one, you're the president of your business. Mm-hmm. Break your business down to all the different departments that even a small business needs. You need your sales, marketing, delivery, um, content writing, blog posting, web development. All these are different functions. Now, they don't have to be hired in your company, but they're services that you may want to hire out or like what websites you may want to buy a template get it up so far and then you know know the background know how it's all set up and then hire a kid or something to come in and maintain it you know that's good with websites or you know so you you start offloading some of these things that are just going to take time away from you building your business Mm -hmm. communication is probably one of the the big things for a coach we do a lot of listening while we're coaching, but we need to do a lot of talking to sell ourselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. I mean, <clears throat> under communications, there's all kinds of aspects around the communication. So we've got the coaching type of communication. So you're active listening and, and, and picking up on cues and asking the right questions. And then a marketing communication. And the marketing communication is totally different it's a totally different topic because um i mean you're you're without tooting your horn no one's going to know you're there so you have to have you have to have some kind of business marketing communication then you have to know who you're talking to and what their pain points are so that you can address those but um, yes and really if you're excited about the client that you're waking up for to deal with every day mm-hmm. and you're and you're excited and you're familiar with them you know their pain points so you 
should be able to communicate to those people you have chosen to serve because you know them. Mm -hmm. You already know your client. And that's the easiest, that's the easiest client to serve is the one you already know. Mm -hmm. It's the one you're trying to figure out that you don't know how to talk to. That's going to be very hard for you to attract anyways, if that makes sense. I think so. Um, it's getting, it comes back down to this clarity, getting this clarity of, of first off, what it is you're selling, what it is you can do. So, so, so let me just put the points together. So you have to, you have to, as a coach, you have to know what it is you are good at coaching at. And as a business entrepreneur, you need to have an idea of all the various elements of business that need to be taken care of so that you can have a business. And then you create your, um, you create your org chart, your functional org chart, so that you know which parts need to be taken care of. And I think it's lost in, under while you're underway. And then understanding who you're who you're able to coach and who you're able to, to help. So, so we use the word target audience often, but I think target audience that's, that's getting to be a little washed out, you know? Um, if, we, if we start thinking about, you know, this is the person that I can help. It's a real life person, not just a target audience, not just a word. And, and if we know who that person is, if we can, if, like you say, you want to get up in the morning to talk to them. You're ready to get up in the morning to talk to them. So that's what you think has to happen before you can start your business. Is that what you would be offering? Well, that's part of the mindset that you need to have. If you, if you don't want to do a business plan, and if you don't want to do an organizational chart, you're usually going to end up as a freelancer solopreneur, which mm -hmm. means you're going to forever create a job for yourself. You're not going to trust anyone else to actually work in your business to help you grow it or you, or very few people are going to be able to have any responsibility in your business to help you grow it which means you're going to be like atlas you're going to be shouldering everything for your entire business the earlier on that you start with really having a business plan on how to scale and grow your business and having that organizational chart to and, and the organizational chart may change but if you have one from the beginning then you're always working with the mindset that some things need to be hired out that you're not the best at, that you're never, that you don't want to be the expert at. You don't want to be the expert at everything because you want to be great at what you do and not have to be great at doing everything. Cause you can't, no one can, you can't be excellent at everything. Um, Tiger Woods plays golf. So he's great at golf doesn't mean he's great at his own marketing or his own personal life because we know he's had some failures and other things but he's great at golf and so he focuses on it, golf he teaches his son how to play golf I just seen this morning on the news he's him and his son are out there I mean they look like me um yeah mini me but um it's, it's really cool because you know you're teaching and you're coaching because you're the professional but he also hires coaches and he doesn't do everything, you know, I'm sure he's not spending, I'm sure he's spending more time swinging clubs and, and getting great at his profession than he is sitting in the office doing his books or trying to figure out who he needs to call and book a room, you know, when he's going on tour or whatever else. You leave that stuff to other people to do. So you have time to build your business, work on your business and not always in your business. And remember, professionals have coaches, amateurs don't. Yes. Professionals absolutely. get paid to play, amateurs pay to play. <laughs> so coaching should be an easy sell if you have that mindset, because mm -hmm. we're looking for people that want to be professionals and get paid more to play their game of business or whatever it is in their life that they want, want to enhance. And that's why they hire coaches. Love so. that saying that just really just kind of bing, you know. Um, professionals get paid to play and amateurs pay to play. I mean, that's a perfect way of putting it. 
perfect way. Of it is. Yeah, it is. Tiger Wood plays golf to get to get a million dollar, whatever it is the yeah. top pot is. Um, most people that work all the time don't have time to enhance their skills, so they pay every week to go out and play golf. Mm -hmm. You know, and they play 18 holes and, you know, it's a good day because maybe they relaxed uh, and enjoyed the game, but they don't get paid to play golf. So professionals get paid to play and yeah. professional business leaders um, know that they don't know everything and they, they're going to hire coaching to um, help them get paid to play at a higher level. So, and that's all, that's all coaching is, is just helping people play at a higher level. Brilliant. It's a good right. thing you're recording that. <laughs> I, I, I was just thinking, you know, it, um, it's it's a good conversation, and and it's and it's covering a lot of topics that we we were going to talk about different things. We were going to talk about goals today, but this still this is still valuable. It's 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 extremely valuable. Um, well, part of the goal thing is, and, and going back to my original question, what would people want? Because I'm going to implement both webinars and, and the chatbot. I'm going to work on the chatbot. And I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start using webinars. I'm going to trying to figure out what I want to offer for the first of the year. What, what, um, compiled program package I want to offer instead of the one-on-ones I want to put together an offering and I'm going to put together a webinar to sell the offering and I'm going to go through the launch process um, by the end of this year early next year to prove that it's 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 the way to do it it's it's a it's a it works. it's the way to 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 build a business or at least one of the ways because you know, if you've been around me long enough, you know that not everyone should wear yoga pants. Um, one size does not fit all. And there's not just one way to build a business. There's different frameworks, but everyone's got to find their own path. So, um, but I, but I think, I think launching programs and getting things as evergreen as possible, meaning that you can run them without you being there creates an asset in your business without you having to do all the work. And earlier this year, well, for 2020, on my whiteboard was, and it's right there, how can I work less and make more? Um, it's right at the top of my, and it's been the question all year for me. This has been a difficult year because we've all worked less and not necessarily have made more because things just haven't been flowing this year or moving. Um, but I think creating those assets and in, in, in having them as evergreen as possible, where you don't have to sit there and do every live, every webinar live, or even every training, you can have the trainings pre-recorded and then coach to the trainings that someone listened to. So whatever during the week they want to listen to your training, but then have a day of coaching, live coaching that they can, you know, tune into get the life coaching, get the Q and A's and enhance, enhance the training. So, um, um, but, anyways, um, you know, you know, I, I, I was saying earlier that the, the importance of, of trust, the trust factor in a coaching, um, where does that fit in to this, the trust factor? How would you, how would you work on building up that trust factor with your, with your well, I, I do believe that getting in on camera, having people see you, see your facial expressions, know like and trust you, or at least hearing your voice on a, on a voiceover PowerPoint presentation is a, is a good step for building trust. It's hard to, I think it's harder to build, to get trust in a book, but I think it's it, any way that creates or put you out as an expert and you're putting your work out there um, for review, for people to comment, criticize, condemn and complain about whatever, good to bad, the ugly, mm -hmm. uh, is gonna help people build trust in you. So, I mean, and you're, not everyone's gonna like you, not everyone's gonna hate you, 
but you got to put yourself out there and you got to, um, and that's the only way to build trust with people. You can't hide behind a desk and think that, that people are going to know, like, and trust you when they don't even know you're out there. Yeah. And really yeah. people are more focused on themselves and not about you. So it's always presenting your solution to their problem and not that you're just a great coach. So going out and saying, oh, I'm, I'm the greatest, I'm the greatest. People aren't going to listen to that. People are looking for solutions to their own problems. And if you can give them an idea of a solution to the problem that's waking them up at three o'clock in the morning or two o'clock in the morning or keeping them up at night, if you have a solution to that problem and you speak to them, they're going to listen. And um, if it's works, then they're going to know, like, and trust you. Mm -hmm. So you got to give them enough to know what you're actually going to help them with, which I think is a big problem for a lot of consultants and coaches. They don't, they don't fully focus on one client or one type of client. They are all afraid to narrow. They're focused down to, you know, something specific. So they're very broad range and their messaging is all over the place. And so no one really knows what they're offering um, um, at times. Yeah, I, I, I agree. If you if you look at it from, from the target audience thing again, but, but I'd like to go back to a subject you just mentioned, and that's, that's about opening yourself up, making yourself vulnerable. Um, one of the reasons people aren't actually going out there and staying the amateur is because they're afraid of being judged. Yep, exactly. I agree hundred percent with that. So why is, why are people afraid of being judged all the time? Yeah. Why? What do you think it is? Why? Um, not feeling not good enough. I think one of the reasons that that old imposter syndrome yep. that keeps creeping up at all, <laughs> all these conversations under imposter syndrome. I understand something different. I understand in the imposter system so, uh, syndrome that they think someone's going to figure out that I'm not as smart as I'm making myself out to be, which is a little different than for me, which is a little bit different than not feeling good enough. I have to think about that if that's not saying the same thing, just in a different, from yeah. a different angle. So, well, um, I mean, look at websites, for example, sometimes on a website, you'll say, oh, how super duper you are, how great you are. Um, you have these certificates and you have this experience and, and goodness knows you, what all you've done. And it may be true, but you don't feel like it was enough. But that would that for me would be the imposter syndrome. Okay. All right. Some of the so I think sometimes though, and this is my thinking, so I'm just going to give you my perspective, is that people are always getting those certificates because it's not that they don't feel enough. It's an excuse not to step out and be vulnerable. So you just need one more thing before becoming vulnerable. Oh, I just need to learn hypnosis. I need to learn NLP. I need to learn to be a coach, to be a coach. I need to, whatever the need to be or should have been or whatever it is, is an excuse. So they stack all these pieces of paper and certificates and credentials up as a delay measure, <laughs> because if they're in training, they're moving forward, but they're not moving forward to build their business. Mm -hmm. And it's when you have to move forward to get the clients that all these pieces of paper don't really give you the armor that you think it is going yeah. to give you, yeah. you know, and they really yeah. don't mean anything to anybody other you than know, you, because they just want word. the transformation. What's that? Yeah. That's another word you mentioned, the armor. It doesn't give you the armor that you expect it to, or that you thought it would armor. It means you're protecting yourself from something. And again, you're not making yourself vulnerable, which is exactly actually, you're not being authentic. Exactly. You're not being real. Well, they're being real by hiding because they're really <laughs> hiding. <laughs> they're hiding just not real. The <laughs> they're just not really getting out there. 
Um, so it comes down to why, why are they really hiding? Why do they really think they need that one more certificate or that one more credential? Or, you know, why do you go from, uh, you know, a bachelor's to a master's to a doctorate um, and spend all that time in school for what? I'm sure there are multiple reasons. I mean, curiosity is one thing. That's my favorite topic is curiosity. Um, well, no, and, and that's great if you're going to go that route. But if you have a PhD in business and you're not, if and you haven't started a business and there's a C student dropout from high school that's programming and is a multi-billionaire <laughs> uh, that built a business in his garage, what does the PhD give you that, you still haven't utilized that this high school dropout that even built a landscaping business, um, you know, and has 50 people working for him did without a PhD. I yeah. mean, that's, that's what I mean by all the credentials don't really yeah. give you everything that you think it is. It's, yeah. it's, it's taking the action, you know, Bingo. taking the action. Bingo. That's the word. That's the word. Yeah, take action, step out. Mm -hmm. Make yourself um, vulnerable. Put yourself out there. Let people judge you if they have to, but stand over it. That's your armor, your ability to not care if somebody is judging you. Yeah, I, I know a lot of people. Um, you know, he, he, I, I remember even like the thespians in college that were, you know, did a play or a performance or even some professionals have said that they do, they do not read the reviews because they really don't have time to worry about what other people think. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they go to their coach. If their coach said they did good, the producer said they did well. It doesn't matter what Really, as long as the audience is buying tickets, that's the only judgment you need. You don't, who cares about the reviews? I remember Cisco and Ebert giving two thumbs down to E.T., the movie E.T. when it came out. Okay. And, uh, you know, it was one of the box office smashes, you know, of all time. So the reviews don't always mean what you think they're going to be. People voting by their, by their wallet or purse, you know buying tickets is going to, is a better review than looking in the professional review journals <laughs> and seeing them criticize you. Absolutely. In marketing, we would say share of wallet, right? So how much of what they have are they giving to you? What they have right. available, what are they giving to you? And um, they're judging. They're, and, and there's another way of saying it, judging with their feet. Yep. Absolutely. How many actors and actresses actually screw up their lives to get into the media? <laughs> they're, they're train wrecks, but they get in there as free publicity. Yeah. Uh, good, bad, or indifferent. They, I, I sometimes think they do it just because they're so intense on getting in front Attention? and out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Where, there's where no most thing people, like bad press is what we used to say, right? What's there's that? No, there's no thing. There's nothing. There is no such thing as bad press. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So, so a coach or or a small business or a freelancer that is not even putting themselves out there, so no one even knows they're out there, is not getting any press. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you got to get some kind of press. So, yeah, I mean, I have to think about is is really kind of funny. The first time I heard about this, I thought it was um, ethically questionable. <laughs> let's put it this way. But um, there was um, I, I met a fellow once at a networking event who was putting uh, all kinds of advertisements in the local newspaper for jobs. So he was looking for a secretary. He was looking for a quality person. He was looking for a project manager. He was all this other stuff, right? And he wasn't hiring. He wasn't, he wasn't even intending to hire, but he wanted to give the impression, this is a company that's flourishing and they're hiring, they're bringing in people all the time. <laughs> so 
So um, he would, you know, he had standardized letters for thank you for your application. We have chosen someone else or something, or we have, you know, but that was that he did that. He really did do that. And that is a way to advertise. Um, you get your name out there. People think you're growing and moving. Um, yeah, so I mean, it, it works. It's not, I don't think it's honest. That's why um, I say ethically questionable. <laughs> yeah, because I, I've, I've, before COVID, I was working with the job, a job seekers networking group mm -hmm. as a business owner, helping job seekers, especially as they get older, you know, mm -hmm. um, different ways to get out and market themselves because it's not just sending out resumes anymore. You mm -hmm. actually have to kind of be creative in marketing yourself if you're looking for employment. Um, and, and it is very emotionally um, hurtful to get that letter of, no, we've already hired or whatever. So if you're doing it intentionally with no, with no reason to even hire or no, yeah, no reason to even hire without without even the thought of really hiring somebody, but you're just going to let people down that are really struggling to look for a job is is like really, and I, I keep saying really, and I shouldn't be saying really, but it is horrible to what you're doing to someone's psyche yes. by, you know, sending them a rejection letter when they're really focused and hoping on trying to get a job to support their family. I'm putting which, their hopes into that. I mean, yeah. Which is also why investing in business is a better, safer way to go than relying on someone else to, you know, supply your uh, sustenance, your your livelihood, you know, working for someone. If you own your own business and your own investments and you have the revenue that you control, it's it's a it's a safer safer bet even though even though this, the way we're taught it's the less secure option is to own a business and they'll tell you how many people fail in business or go out of business but at the same time they never tell you the statistics of how many people are laid laid off yeah <laughs> or fired from from a job yeah or you know when the, when that business closes that has failed how many people were let go because of that one mm -hmm. business failure? So that, and that's the reason for heroic endeavors, because I believe when you start hiring people, you need to be the hero of your business and grow it because now you're responsible for the lives that you are bringing in that you're making a promise to because they're rejecting someone else's possible offer for employment. They're working, they decide to work for you. And then if you're not running your, your enterprise properly and you go out of business or, you know, I mean, we, there's no guarantees, but you know, if, if you're taking money off the top and, and there's not enough money to support the business and everything, you're affecting other people's lives. So, you know, it's hard I mean, to be the hero when you've neglected and, and, you know, that's, with. that's, that's a pretty steep responsibility when you take that on. If you're an entrepreneur and you're starting your own business, and like you said, you have your own, you have your organizational chart, your functional organizational chart, um, you're not actually hiring someone. You're probably engaging a freelancer somewhere, or you've got um, a agency doing something for you, or you're not hiring a bookkeeper, not off the bat, right? You're hiring a company with a bookkeeper. Or would you hire a bookkeeper right away? Or would you hire someone in your company? Would you say, you are now my employee. I will take care of your health insurance. I will take care of um, your sick leave. I will give you vacation um, so and so many days a year. You don't start like that. No, but if you hire a contractor to do your bookkeeping, they don't work for you. They work somewhere else. And you're one of their contracts. Yes. If you fail, they have lost that portion of their income until right. it's replaced by someone else. Yeah. So even if you even if you're not hiring directly, mm -hmm. all the all the sub businesses that you touch financially 
you know, web designers that you may hire kids cleaning up or wh whatever it is, you're still, you're not maybe financially responsible on a continual basis, like a W-2 employee mm -hmm. in the United States would be a W-2 employee. But as soon as you bring in a 1099 contractor, they're relying on some part of whatever their contracted service with you is to, for their part of their livelihood, even if it's only a percentage, um, you well, know. just like you are as a coach, your, your, your livelihood depends on the customers that you are choosing. So you actually need yeah. to put some effort into choosing the right customer. The one that you know you can be successful with. Yes, because your reputation is on the line. So people are hiring coaches to get to get something. Um, and and this is this is a difficult thing with a freelance coach that doesn't know how to or a solopreneur coach that doesn't know how to build a business or have assets in their business that keep income coming in or investments keep income coming in. Because if you are relying on always finding the one on one client to coach that's going to keep money in your pocket and feed your family, if that's what you're relying on, then you're almost and I hate to say this, I really hate to say this, but you're almost setting yourself up to make that person dependent on you because you're dependent dependent on them. So it's a codependency. And that's okay. one thing I always tell my clients is I don't create codependence. They can work with me, a, you know, if I'm taking you on as a one-on-one -on -one client, you can work with me in a month, three months, five months, six months, whatever. I'm not here to be your guru and make you you know, work with me forever. Cause I don't want those dependencies. That's the worst type of coaching or professional service. I think out there is the ones that aren't looking out for their client's best interest, but need those clients to, to pay the bills. So they got to find ways to keep them mm -hmm. coming back. Yeah. And yeah. Um, that, that, that's actually not even coaching. That's just bad business. That's not, that's bad. That's bad coaching. Or let's say that's not even coaching. It's not even coaching, because as a coach, what you want to do is you want to help someone get through a challenge so that they get out on the other side and they're better off for it. And if they keep coming up with, you know, if you keep making them dependent upon you, they're not they're not getting better. They're not being, they're not able to do what actually a coach is supposed to be helping them to do is to learn how to get through trying times, get over obstacles, ways and means and tools and, and, and methods to address the things that are holding them back or where a challenge keeps coming up. But I mean, you can, you know, come back to a coach after a while and say, hey, listen, I had, you know, we worked together on this and it went really well and, and blah, blah, blah. And now I have this other issue and I seem stuck there. Can you help me with that? There's nothing against that. There's nothing you could say you know, against that. No, and that's really what I want clients to do. I, I want to get them to the point where they've overcome a challenge. They've implemented some strategies and now they can go out and do things on their own. And then when the time comes that they hit the next wall, you know, run into the next wall, run out of rope again, or whatever, however you want to put it, they have the next challenge and they come back and say, you know, you helped me last time, you know, let's mm -hmm. take a look and, and you can help me again. Cause they know, like, and trust you because you've done a good job. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and, and they're also referring. So if you are doing a good job in helping people get out and over their challenges, then they're, they're more apt to refer business to you. So you don't need to become codependent with your clients. Mm -hmm. If your clients know, like, and trust you enough to refer business to you, you're, you're going to have enough business on the, yeah. on the one-on-one -on -one end, or if they go through a program and they, and they, you know, like your program and they know other people that need what you're offering, say goal setting or whatever else, they'll refer people over to your program and, um, mm -hmm. you know, your group coaching. What we were talking about earlier about trust factor, trust factor, your reputation, um, it all it all ties in together. How you how authentic you're showing up, how how and, and the vulnerability. You know, you can 
to recognize that you are vulnerable because you only have this one client at the moment. And if you let them go, um, you're not yet really sure how you're going to pay the bills this month, for example. Yeah, needy is, needy is really creepy. It's it, needy is creepy. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, and, and it and it shows up, and and clients just know it. You know. Uh, yeah, it's never it's never a good thing. So. Yeah, which which is why I'm I'm really. Again, want to take my business coaching to the next to an to other phase of adding investing in because I think if if businesses sole proprietors or small business owners can learn to invest in how to invest and what to invest in, then they're actually securing their you know they have their money working for them. So if your business is buying assets and you're creating assets within your business, it's a good turnover program for for your business growth. Um, if all you have is money going out and you're not creating those assets like programs or mm -hmm. teachables or books or whatever things that can keep reselling without you working mm -hmm. and you're always just working, then um, you haven't created an asset within your business. Mm -hmm. You know, you got to keep working. Um, um, I think creating assets for your business would be the good topic for a separate podcast probably cool. yeah they go they go they definitely go hand in hand though so yeah so i'm gonna stop recording now okay and um